It's 1587, and Mr. John White, a cartographer and painter, is on a ship leading an expedition back to the colony of Roanoke, which is off the coast of present-day North Carolina. And he's got much-needed supplies for the people, making up the second attempt at starting the very first permanent English settlement in North America. Now, John White has no business leading an expedition and no experience, but the guy funding this expedition, Walter Raleigh, well, he likes John White because John was able to convince enough people to go on this perilous expedition in the first place. And Walter Raleigh was super keen to make this one work. Might have something to do with the fact that Mr. Raleigh needs to get a colony going by 1591 or he loses his rights to colonization. That right, by the way, coming straight from Queen Elizabeth I herself, who is also, of course, eager to get on with the expansion of the British Empire. See, the colony that England had established a few years earlier in Canada just wasn't cutting the mustard. And I'm also going to assume she was in a bad mood at this time, seeing as how she recently had to have her cousin Mary beheaded for plotting to kill her. Or maybe she was delighted about that, who knows. The point is, there was a lot of pressure on everybody to make sure this colony was successful. None more than John White, whose family had been back on the island waiting for this resupply mission. So, back to John on his boat. He's been on a rough journey across the Atlantic, down through the Caribbean and back up the east coast of America. England is at war with Spain. He doesn't really want to be on this supply run in the first place. As I said, he left his family behind, which includes his granddaughter, the first Brit born in America. There are also 115 middle-class Londoners and a native Croatoan islander named Matteo. John White is probably super anxious, but he's also hopeful too. He's just off the shore of Roanoke. It's his granddaughter's birthday in the morning, and he spends the night singing English songs, hoping his family on the island can hear him. It's August 18th, 1590. In the morning, they wake up and paddle to the shore, and who does he see when he finally arrives back to his new home? No one. Not a single living soul is left on the island. The only thing he finds is an abandoned village and the word Croatone carved into a wooden post. Was everyone dead? Lost? Did they relocate to Croatone Island? Well, we'll see if we can find out in today's episode of Past Pass. Hi there, you, and welcome to today's episode of Past Pass. I'm Russell Futures, of course, and today we're going to be talking about the lost colony of Roanoke, an American mystery that's haunted historians and conspiracy theorists alike for centuries. Shown in pop culture and TV shows and movies such as American Horror Story, Supernatural, and Stephen King's Storm of the Century, the lost colony has been a subject of fascination for decades. But what really happened to the colony? And why are historians still searching for answers after all these years? Well, let's see if we can find out. But before we try to answer those questions, just a quick trigger warning here. This episode will talk about violence toward Native people and briefly some white supremacy. So if you're not into that, we'll see you in the next episode. But please take care of yourself and use your discretion before watching. All right, let's get into it. So, uh, to start things off, let's go back to the first attempt at a colony on Roanoke Island. It was 1585, and Sir Richard Grenville, who is the cousin of Walter Raleigh, takes his fleet and explores the territory around North Carolina, looking for a nice place to settle. And eventually they arrive at a village called Aquascagic, inhabited by the Pomlico people, and they hang out for a minute, you know, saying hello, introductions and such, and then Grenville gets really pissed off because he thinks someone stole one of his silver drinking cups and decides to sack and burn the entire village. So there you go, that's the kind of guy we're dealing with here. Anyway, eventually they arrive on Roanoke and set up a small colony. And then later on, Grenville leaves to go on a supply mission. And because he takes too long to get back, the leader of the expedition decides to just leave with another captain and go somewhere else. Well, like two weeks later, Grenville comes back and finds out that the surviving colonists have just departed. Grenville, of course, heads back to England because he's not staying in some empty colony with limited supplies and no people. So... Grenville bolts for England, but leaves behind about 15 of his own men to defend the new territory. 
These guys are like, oh, cool. Thanks, dick. Don't worry about us. We got this. See you whenever, you know, you decide to come back, I guess. So by 1586, all we have so far is 15 dudes with swords who probably haven't showered like ever alone on a beach in North Carolina. So basically the worst spring break party ever. During his voyage back to England, Grenville decides that he's going to do a little plundering through the Azores Islands. You know, standard colonialist shitty behavior. Uh, by the way, the Azores Islands are the exact place Grenville will die five years later. Anyway, the reason I wanted to mention Captain Dick's raiding party is because there is a hilarious description of his behavior during this time given by some Spanish captains he had been dining with one evening. Quote, he would cruise three or four glasses of wine. I'm actually just going to translate this to modern language. He would chug three or four glasses of wine and in bravery take the glasses between his teeth, crush them in pieces, and swallow them down so that often the blood ran out of his mouth without any harm at all unto him. So in short, Sir Grenville's an absolute psychopath. Okay, so flash forward to spring 1587 and Walter Raleigh, Grenville's cousin, the guy with the bankroll, recruits John White to lead a group of 115 to 118 middle-class men and women to the east coast of North America. According to an article by the First Colony Foundation, quote, Raleigh's aim was to establish a colony so as to stake England's claim to the largely unknown, to Europeans, landmass of North America and from which he could launch raids on the Spanish West Indies and annual treasure fleets. And as I said earlier, the clock was ticking on his rights to establish a colony. You know, they have these things called land patents, and they have an expiration date on them. As you recall, John White was a cartographer and a painter, not a politician, not a ship captain, not really a leader at all. But despite his lack of leadership experience, he was going to be the future governor of this new domain of the Queen. By the way, remember that first attempt in 1585 with Captain Dick Grenville? Well, John White was with that one, too. He was just tagging along as the artist, but he was there. He apparently picked up a few things on that first try, and he was ready to lead his own expedition two years later. In July 1587, the second expedition arrived. This time, White's own family was a part of the expedition, if you recall from the intro, including his pregnant daughter, Eleanor Dare, her husband, and that Croatoan native leader named Matteo that I mentioned, who traveled to England and returned with the newest expedition. And this latest one was expected to be successful. I mean, John White even brought his future grandchild along. So the trip was supposed to bring them to the hopeful Chesapeake Bay, a land where the waters around it were easier to navigate and the native population seemed a bit, quote, friendlier, or rather not yet abused and killed by the English settlers. And because of this, wealthier people joined the trip in hopes of economic gain and to broaden their influence, right? But there was a problem. Instead of the intended Chesapeake Bay, the expedition actually ended up at the location of the first failed settlement, Roanoke. According to the Encyclopedia of Virginia, Simon Fernandez piloted the flagship Lion to Roanoke so that they might check on Grenville's men and drop off Manteo and his companion Tawaya who had spent the last 10 months in England. The stop at the former Roanoke colony was initially to see if the soldiers left from the previous expedition were still alive and doing well, and upon arrival, they found that everyone was doing great. Uh, actually, no, they, they found no one. No trace of the men that were meant to greet them. Worse than that, the ship's crew informed White that he and his settlers were not welcome to reboard the ship and that they should just get off there. The change of plans is one of the bigger debates surrounding the Roanoke colony mystery. The reason is not really known. What's even stranger is that White himself seemed to not really put up much of a fight against the captain of the ship, despite Raleigh's orders to go to Chesapeake Bay. According to the National Park Service, from the beginning, it seems that there were problems between Governor White and Simon Fernandez, the pilot. Off the coast of Portugal, they lost a flyboat in a storm. On the 16th of July, they sighted the mainland. According to White, Fernandez mistook the vicinity off Cape Fear for the island of Croatoan and almost wrecked the fleet. So I don't know why John White is listening to this captain, but for some reason, without much protest, the ship docked and forced off over a hundred people at a previously failed settlement located about a hundred miles from their intended destination. It was a trip doomed to fail, led by a guy with poor judgment. But without much of a choice, the settlers began to repair the houses left behind by the previous residents. And then, not long after they arrived on July 28th, John White's advisor, George Howe, was found dead about two miles from the settlement. 
Great start, guys. He was killed by 16 arrows to his body while he was out crab fishing. They soon found out later from Manteo's Croatone tribe that another local tribe, the Sokotan people, were responsible for George Howe's death, as well as the deaths of the soldiers that had been there previously. So, in response, and with poor planning skills, a group of soldiers from the new colony, along with Manteo, attempted to ambush the tribe in retaliation. But what they found wasn't what they expected. They attacked a tribe, yes, they did, but the tribe they attacked was not part of the Sokotan people they were going after. No, they accidentally murdered Manteo's own people. <sighs> See, what happened is a group of the Croatan people had visited this abandoned village to collect supplies left behind by the previous tribe. And these soldiers in Manteo came in and accidentally killed them all. And of course, they were shocked. They had attacked one of the only allied tribes around them and killed some of Manteo's people who, despite Manteo trusting the English, were already fearful of them. This terrible event marked the steady decline of the relationships between some local native tribes and English settlers in the area. Soon after the attack, John White's granddaughter was born. And on August 18, 1587, Virginia Dare became the first English settler to be born on North American soil. An important moment for the British Empire now, in the meantime, remember that ship that forced them off and just left them on the island? Well, it didn't actually leave. It had been unloading stuff from the ship for like a month. And not long after Virginia Dare was born, the ship was completely unloaded finally and ready to return to England. Now, someone from the colony would need to return with the ship to report to Sir Walter Raleigh about the conditions of the settlement and how the adjustment had gone. They also needed to let everyone know that they relocated the colonists also knew that they were in dire need of more supplies, and they feared the worst if they didn't get them. But the only way to get relief was to send a high-ranked individual to request it. But when asked for a volunteer to return to England, everybody refused. I mean, I would too, considering how awful the journey had been to get there in the first place. I mean, we're talking six weeks to six months across the Atlantic, if you were lucky to not get sick and die along the way, of course. So, instead of volunteering for the job, the colonists assembled in front of White and asked him to go and represent them. Well, John White throws a tantrum. I mean, he's the future governor after all. How could they demand him to go on a supply run? <clears throat> so anyway, John White eventually agrees to go, but before he does, he demands that they all place their requests in writing, noting his reluctance, and then he agrees to head back, leaving someone else in charge. So, on August 25th, 1587, John White leaves on the ship back to England in hopes of getting supplies and one day seeing his granddaughter again. He leaves behind some people to watch over the colony, knowing that if they had to leave and abandon the colony for whatever reason, that they would carve their destination in a tree along with a cross if the cause was an attack. Little did he know that he would never see his family or any of the colonists ever again. Upon White's return to England, after stopping in Ireland and making his way home, he found the country at the beginning of a war with Spain, better known as the Anglo-Spanish War, that took place between 1585 and 1694. When John White finally arrived after taking his sweet time, King Philip II of Spain was planning an invasion of England. According to the North Carolina Museum of History, the Spanish Armada wreaked havoc on English shipping, forcing Queen Elizabeth to stop further expeditions to North America for three years. White was forbidden to leave England. In the beginning of 1588, White finally got his chance to go back to Roanoke. The boats were named Brave and Row. They were two boats that could be spared due to them being unfit for military use at sea. Actually, they didn't seem to be fit for any use, really. The captain struggled to maintain control as the ships fought the ocean waves. Eventually, they were attacked by French pirates in an event that would literally lead to John White being shot in the ass. You can't make this up. The pirates, of course, looted all their goods and forced the two ships to turn back with their tail between their legs. Not looking good, John. For two more years, White was unable to travel to Roanoke because of the advancing Spanish Armada and the lack of clearance. That is, until March of 1590. When the threat of Spain relaxed, Raleigh was able to secure two ships for White to begin his relief mission again. It wasn't until August 18, 1590, his granddaughter's third birthday, by the way, that they would arrive back on North America's shores. 
The long trip was fraught with several sea battles and bad weather, which slowed the ship's course. The landing itself caused the death of seven men who struggled to get ashore. Once on shore, they expected to see a colony waiting for their return, with his grandchild toddling along the coastline. Instead, they found nothing but rotting buildings and overgrown weeds. John White, in his journal, describes seeing heavy items thrown about and chests dug up from the ground and ransacked. His own possessions, kept safe by the colonists, were still there, but weathered and torn. All that was left, besides the ruin they encountered, were the letters C-R-O carved into a nearby tree and Croatoan carved into a post, but no cross and no signs of distress among the letters. So White and those with him assumed that the abandoned camp had relocated to the native town of Croatoan, or modern-day Hatteras Island, the home of Manteo. This comforted White, and he attempted to set sail for the island to find his family. However, the weather and the sea grew harder and harder to navigate, the ship losing three anchors in the process. Not being able to afford another loss, the ship turned its course, abandoning the search for the relocated people and effectively sealing the fate of the Roanoke colony as the lost colony of American history. White would never return to the New World ever again, and he would later die in Ireland living on one of Raleigh's estates. You'd think he'd want to try and find his family, but he just gave up. Maybe that's a bit harsh. I mean, it's not like Roanoke was down the street. I mean, we're talking thousands of miles and... Lord knows how much money to even get started, but it was a humiliating failure for him. Maybe it's a good thing he was never asked to try and start another colony again. So, what the heck happened to this colony? Speculation around the events has led to the development of some pretty radical theories, anywhere from resettling with the local native tribes to zombies. Yeah, some of the theories are pretty outlandish, but it's fun to talk about them nonetheless. The first theory is that a local native tribe killed the settlers, like the soldiers they left behind from the first settlement. Now, this theory isn't an unlikely one, considering the violence the Englishmen enacted against the local tribes, but it's one that lacks evidence. For one, no bodies were found. I mean, it had been three years, there would have been some evidence of bones or items they left behind. Also, there was no cross carved in the wood beside the name of the place where they were going, as was instructed by John White before he left for England. I mean, they had time to carve the word Croaton, so surely they would have had time to carve a little cross in the wood too, right? I don't know, maybe they carved it somewhere else, or maybe it was there and John just didn't see it. Anyway, the only evidence for this theory is found amongst the records of Jamestown settlers who arrived in 1607. John Smith a leader in the new Jamestown settlement, had been captured by a local tribe who informed him that just a handful of people had escaped Roanoke during a massacre and had been taken in by the Okanahonan people. They stated that the tribe members wore clothes like John Smith and that the English taught them how to build stone walls. Now, this account, if accurate, points to survivors of a massacre rather than a total wipeout of Roanoke. Now, eyewitness accounts are not all that reliable, but still pretty good evidence nonetheless. The other piece of evidence that might support this theory is the Dare Stone. In 1937, a California tourist traveling through the swamps of North Carolina found a stone that appeared to be a relic of Roanoke times. The stone read in modern English, Anionis Dare in Virginia went hence unto heaven 1591. Any Englishman show this rock to John White governor of Virginia. On the other side, it read, Father, soon after you go to England, we came here. Only misery and war for two years. Above half dead for these two years, more from sickness, being 24. And here she uses the word savage, but I'm going to use the word native instead. A native with a message of a ship came to us. Within a small space of time, they became frightened of revenge and ran all away. We believe it was not you. Soon after, the natives said spirits were angry. Suddenly they murdered all save seven. My child and Ananias too were slain with much misery. Buried all near four miles east of this river upon a small hill. Names were written all there on a rock. Put this there also. If a native shows this to you, we promised you would give them great plenty presents. Signed, E.W.D. 
So this stone is presumed to have been signed by Eleanor Dare, John White's daughter. This translation, by the way, can be found within the book The Lost Rocks by Professor David Lavere. The stone was thought to be real by the Emory professors that investigated it. And because of this, the university put out a bounty on stones of the same sort and offered a reward of $500 if they were brought in. Soon, fake stones were popping up, mostly turned in by a man from Georgia who was a stone cutter. And not long after that, an article came out in the Sunday Post describing the entire thing as a hoax used to make the university more famous. The author also exposed the Georgia stonecutters having a past of forging such things. But although those were easily debunked as fake, the first stone, however, has proven a difficult piece to identify, with archaeologists and linguists uncertain of its authenticity just yet. Also, a problem with discussing a lot of theories surrounding the potential early death of Virginia Dare, the first white English child born on American soil, is that her death has been utilized by white supremacists for decades now. According to the Washington Post in an article posted in 2018, at the 1907 exposition celebrating Jamestown's 300th anniversary, Virginia Dare was hailed in the North Carolina exhibit as that infant child of pure Caucasian blood, who launched, quote, the birth of the white race in the Western Hemisphere. Even now, white supremacists and their allies claim Virginia Dare as their own. Peter Brimelow, a friend of former White House aide Stephen K. Bannon and current White House advisor Stephen Miller, founded the V-Dare Foundation and V-Dare.com in 1999 to warn Americans about the danger posed by African and Asian immigrants, end quote. It sucks that a child born 400 years ago can be used as a symbol of white supremacy, but it's important to mention when talking about theories surrounding her death and to add caution to the discussion. The next theory, and the most likely one to be correct, is that the colony dispersed and entered into local tribes. I mean, during this time, investigations of tree rings show that there was likely a bad drought occurring, forcing the colony to relocate. There are actually two theories within this theory. Either the colonists fled to Croatoan or they assimilated with the other local tribes. The first one is claiming that the lost colony did exactly what they were supposed to do. They carved the location they were relocating to in a tree for John White to see and then go find them. He simply gave up too soon. Researchers have been searching throughout the Croatone Island, modern-day Hatteras Island, in search of evidence of assimilation between the two groups of people. So far, they've excavated pieces of writing templates, gun parts, copper eyelets, copper agelets, and other goods. The problem with these pieces is that as much as they are evidence for the Roanoke settlers to have moved in with the native tribe, it could just as easily be goods traded between the two or traded between the tribe and the soon-to-be-established Jamestown. The single piece of evidence that was thought to be the answer to the Roanoke mystery, a gold ring found on Hatteras Island thought to have belonged to a prominent official, was recently discovered to be made from bronze and not gold, meaning it was actually used for trading with natives and wasn't a possession of a high-ranking official of Roanoke. Despite this, Hatteras Island still stands as the likely location for the lost colony and will continue to be excavated. The second portion of the theory is that the colony entered into local native tribes. John White himself was informed that local native tribes had been seen with the Englishmen. In 2012, researchers were studying a watercolor map painted by John White of the surrounding areas of the Roanoke colony in it, they discovered a white patch that had been painted by white to cover up something. Using spectroscopy, researchers were able to see a blue and red diamond marking a fort about 50 miles west of the Roanoke colony. According to an article by National Geographic, scholars speculated that white wanted to hide the existence of the fort from the Spanish, who viewed the Roanoke venture as a threat to their domination of North America and the critical shipping lanes off North Carolina's outer banks. The Spanish sent an expedition to wipe out the rogue colony, but they too failed to find the settlers. So near this site, now called Site X, ooh, spooky, was a small native village called Metaquem. The town was said to have occupied a small group of 80 to 100 people. In 2015, a crew sponsored by the First Colony Foundation excavated Site X in hopes of finding evidence of the lost colony. What they found there were pieces of European pottery. Now, the first group of known English people to have settled that area was much later in 1655. 
but the pottery pieces were in a style called border ware, which was the type of pottery used at early settlements like Roanoke and Jamestown. And the few pottery pieces discovered at Site X were nothing compared to the ones they discovered at Site Y, just two miles north of Site X, where they found even more. Now, evidence from these sites is still being debated as these goods could have been there as a result of Jamestown traders, right? However, what gives researchers hope is the lack of clay pipes. See, by the early 1600s, pipe smoking had been appropriated from the Native Americans and was incredibly popular in England. If the trader was from Jamestown in the early 1600s, his collection of trade goods would definitely have included a lot of clay pipes. The fact that neither site includes any clay pipes is a positive indicator that the sites weren't part of later trading and maybe parts of the settlements of the relocated Roanoke colony. But Russell, what about the zombies, you ask? Well, according to the Zombie Research Society, yes, that is a thing, stop laughing, there is a theory that an outbreak of a zombie virus may have occurred in the colony. This might seem radical, but evidence has been found of cannibalism occurring in the Jamestown settlement. And because of this, some conspiracy theorists believe that cannibalism may have been the demise of the Roanoke colony. But where did the virus go, you ask? Well, the theory is that because of their isolation, you know, after eating each other and with no more humans to spread the virus, the zombies died and with them, the virus. According to the Zombie Research Society, the zombies would have decomposed, becoming part of the earth, and, theoretically, the virus waits deep within the soil of the lost colony of Roanoke for the day someone uncovers it. Uh, not likely, but you gotta admit, that is a pretty fun theory. From zombies to just simply leaving the colony, the Roanoke mystery is one that has been on the minds of Americans for hundreds of years. Maybe one day we might find the ultimate clue that explains all of this, but for now, this mystery will continue to haunt us far into the future. Thanks for watching today's episode of Past Past. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the Thinkology channel and go check out all the other amazing videos here. If you'd like to follow my stuff, you can find me at A Voyage of Being. Links probably down in the description. All right, see you next time.